it's difficult to recall a time in our recent history that has been more uncertain than right now. The pandemic dealt a catastrophic blow to organizations that have spent the past two and a half years wading through its effects with painstakingly slow progress. In 2022, uncertainty, I think it's fair to say, has become the norm. And this makes the release of ERMSA's ISRR code a guideline for companies on successfully integrating strategy, risk and resilience all the more essential, particularly when it comes to reading, digesting, and implementation. I want to discuss this important document with me today to uh, put more flesh on the bones, so to speak, is ERMSA's Chief Risk Advisor, Christopher Palm, along with Spiros Faturas, who's the Chief Executive Officer at Marsh Africa, which is a sponsor of the report. Gentlemen, to both of you, a very warm welcome. Chris, first of all, give us an outline of this document. What's the thinking and why is it important? Good morning, Jeremy. Good morning to the audience. Well, I suppose, Jeremy, firstly, we are UMSA. We are the Institute of Risk Management South Africa. We are the professional body uh, representing risk professionals, risk practitioners, so it is expected of us, and it's also part of our strategy to be a thought leader, to continuously challenge not just best practice, but of course, next practice. So I, I think that's the first, the first part of the response. The second part, of course, we, we deliver over the past couple of years, we've been, we've been delivering the South Africa Risk Report um, as one, uh, we have been unpacking the national as well as the global landscapes as you, as you may, in, as far as what are the developments out there. And then, of course, the lessons learned from that. And just back to South Africa specific, if you think about the last five, six, seven, eight years worth of risk reports, we are continuously challenging the reason why risks, although well identified, well articulated, why do they still materialize? So from that perspective, we as UMSA challenge the value proposition of risk management. And then of course, as you alluded to the impact of COVID-19. So that has put risk management into the spotlight. And I believe that we are expected to deliver more than what we are as a profession at the moment. There, there, is, there is a better value proposition that we can irk out out of this opportunity that the profession has been presented. And so it's from that perspective that UMSA investigated this next practice that we were thinking about. As a matter of fact, over the last four years, we've been playing around with our master classes, looking at the impact of risk management on decision making, the alignment of risk management with strategy. And of course, that is already well established within the governance frameworks. The question was still, can we as risk management deliver this expected value in isolation? And this is what the guideline on integrating strategy, risk and resilience is all about. Menos, can you give us uh, your understanding of why the integrated approach is so important? Morning, Jeremy. Um, morning, viewers. Yeah, thanks, Jeremy. I mean, I think it's critical. I mean, if you think effectively about, um, you know, as Chris has mentioned, you know, we're really living in unprecedented times. And you know, if you think about the complexity of the world, the acceleration of data and technology, and and I think many companies, whilst they have very established risk management practices, often operate in silos. You know, particularly when you think about strategy, when you think about managing risk, and really the response to, to disruptive events like we've seen with the, the COVID-19 pandemic. So I think essentially, you know, working with EMSA and coming up with a framework that leads to integrate, you know, strategy, um, you know, risk and resilience, is critical because all three of those factors are really forward looking if you think about it from an organization perspective and bringing those together in sort of a holistic combined framework we feel unlocks a lot of value and puts organizations in a better position to create informed decisions around those three key levers in any business which is strategy risk and resilience christopher the way in which risk informs strategy given 
the changes that we have experienced, as I mentioned, in the past two and a half years. Has anything changed? Has the amplification uh, become more pronounced? Absolutely. I, I think what we have learned over the over and analyzing the, as I said, the risk reports, analyzing those who succeeded through COVID and those who, who faltered or, um, or experienced COVID as a challenge was that strategy and risk both have similar uh, tools, similar parts of their processes that contribute to setting better strategy. And by doing these in isolation, uh, we, we miss the opportunity to robustly stress test the strategies identified, the assumptions that those strategies are built on, and then, of course, ultimately, the strategies that we decide on that we select to take forward. And in understanding those overlaps within what the strategic or the strategy setting processes deliver, but as well as risk management, the two views put together, Jeremy, is what I believe is adding the value so that by design, we make better selections of the strategies that should support the vision and the mission of any organization, whether you are private, whether you are a service oriented public sector, or even a small, medium and micro enterprise outfit. This is uh, the fundamental change that we are putting forward. And that's only looking at the relationship between strategy and risk. Spiros, it's not just an internal process either. One quote strikes me in this report, and, and, and let me read it uh, to you. Collaboration should extend beyond the organization's boundaries into its business ecosystem. Can you elaborate on that for me? Yep. Thanks, Jeremy. Again, I mean, we've touched on it, and it'll be a recurring theme of the conversation. You know, the world has become complex. Um, the world has become global in terms of its um, interconnectedness. If you look at the OMSA risk report and also the global risk report that's published by the World, world Economic Forum, you know, in conjunction with Marsh McLennan and companies, you really see how risks are interconnected. So, you know, let me give a practical example. You know, cyber is very topical at the moment. If you think about your supply chain and you have the framework from a cyber point of view, you know, everyone in your supply chain um, needs to have as robust risk management and security measures from a cyber perspective as you do. Otherwise, you create a backdoor into your system. So how do you deal with that supply chain and how do you ensure a consistent security framework, again, in the context of cyber? So. Now, I think that's a practical example in that <clears throat> when you think about risk, when you think about resilience, understanding the interconnectedness of everything is critical. And that means you have to engage holistically in your own organization and you have to think about who touches your business and how they interface with your business. And you have to extend those conversations to various stakeholders. So again, back to cyber, just to close the example, many companies have taken a a zero trust approach with their suppliers and have effectively said, you know, we don't trust your systems at all and we will audit and review them as if you were our own business. And those are some of the things that you need to think about. So I think it is a function of where the world is and another function of where the world has come from in the last two years, Jeremy. Spiros, let's talk a little more practically if we can. I can't help but think, as you give me that answer, of, of a risk manager being uh, uh, the conductor of an orchestra. And that orchestra needs to play in harmony, but often the different instruments can be very strident. How can you pull all of this together to create that harmony? Has the job of a risk manager or a risk consultant become incrementally more difficult? It's an excellent question. Um I don't think the job of a risk manager has become incrementally more difficult. I think the environment in which they operate has become incrementally, well, probably fundamentally more complex. Um, there's no doubt that risk um, is now at the forefront of every executive agenda. Um, you talk to any organization at this point in time, the two key issues that come up are ESG, um, you know, climate concerns, and cyber. Those are the two big themes. And if you think about both of those issues, they're very difficult for any company to solve in isolation. So 
I think the risk manager has to adopt a new framework to, you know, take advantage of the fact that now risk is at the C-suite of every organization and think about how do they drive that change and how can they practically engage with different parts of the business and different stakeholders. So I think the role has changed from being very much understanding the risk of your organization, understanding you know, your function in the business to really one, as you've highlighted, of a, of a, of a conductor. Um, and I prefer the word conductor as opposed to you know, like a concierge. You know, a concierge, you know, you come in and you give someone else the mm. work to do. But as a conductor, you have to understand the risk issues and really bring them together and try to get that holistic view and line up, um, you know, strategy, risk, and resilience. And I think, you know, coming back to the codes, that's what they really try and facilitate by empowering, you know, risk managers and executives, a framework, a guideline in terms of how to look, look at those um, three different views. And Spiros, I'm glad that you used the word resilience because Christopher Palm, the framework that um, Spiros refers to also slots into something called the resilience universe, which is referred to in the report. What is that? Jeremy, I, uh, the example that Spiros used earlier on actually was a really good practical um, way of showcasing what we talk about when we talk about the resilience universe. Resilience goes way beyond incident management and disaster recovery and the like. It does include the entire value chain, both from an internal perspective as well as from an external perspective and considering cyber and supply chain and of course the whole uh, global landscape as far as climate change goes, one has to understand what your exposure is, how does that impact on your vision and strategy of your organization? What are the risks associated in all of that universe that you are defining? And then to do the, 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 the what if game. So um, good decisions will go bad. That is an, a, a truth and it's shown up before and it's, we've learned from that. And that is why we need to understand, not just do we set strategy, then do risk management, and if something goes wrong, oh, how we have to respond. We have to collaborate across all three of these role players so that we have in this complex environment alternative options at the ready when they and should they occur. So understanding your resilience universe is fundamental to being prepared for something that could go wrong. And then, of course, the resilience leg of this is to learn from what we are doing, informing strategy, informing risk management. And so we build a culture of being creative, uh, adaptive, um, and of course, um, innovative. And in that way, you will deliver value to your stakeholders in a sustainable way, but you will also then, and I think this is the, the last comment I would like then to make uh, as far as the resilience go, and that is that you will do all of this by preserving value. Spinos, the document talks about crisis management as the most critical form of resilience to sudden disruption. How then has the thinking towards crisis management changed given the integrated approach that both of you have referred to? Um, you know, again, you know, if you think historically how we've dealt with with crisis, I think it's been, you know, planning um, around events that are have been anticipated. Um, so, you know, whether it's, you know, having a DR site somewhere from a technology perspective, looking at your top 10 risks, thinking about what are the risk mitigation um, protocols you can put in place or the risk prevention measures. Um, but if you just think about the last few years, that has resulted in, in certain blind spots um, that organizations haven't identified. And really, crisis management has then responded exceptionally well, um, but it has been proactive. You mm -hmm. know, I think ideally what this framework wants to try to do is to you know, bring together the three different lenses that are forward-looking and I think expand the horizon of where we think of crisis, how we try to identify crisis and create you know, a more robust 
methodology around scenario planning, sensitivity analysis, thinking about strategy. I mean, working through a crisis, I think that's tried and tested. Organizations know how to go through a crisis, but I think it's that forward-looking view with regards to how you connect the dots. I think that's what really the framework tries to highlight, and it tries to change um, the inputs into crisis management by taking a much more holistic view. Christopher, work through the definition here for me as I, I, I do want to come back to resilience very quickly. The report also talks about the difference between essential resilience and leading edge resilience. Yeah. So, Jeremy, the not every organization, I referred to that a little bit earlier in as far as the size of companies limit I suppose, and this is uh, generalized now, the amount of, of commitment that one can allocate, the, one, the amount of resources that one can allocate to resilience, to crisis management, disaster management, incident management, and the like. So when one looks at a small, medium, or micro enterprise outfit, one would typically revert to a more fundamental response to business continuity management, the learning out of that to create resilience. Compared to somebody, for example, like I, I would think in the financial services, our banks, um, in the utilities industry, ESCOM, Transnet and the like, they would have far more integrated, far more elaborate resilience programs, not that they want to run, but that they need to run and it's all size dependent. And I think that's the, that's the difference. And I think that's where the guideline, by the way, um, actually adds a lot of value as far as C-suites of mega corporations, mega organizations, and you know, the C-suite of smaller companies um, can see the difference of what we, what we present as fundamental versus leading edge sort of um, choices. Both would respond well and adequately in as far as creating fundamentals of crisis management, incident management, disaster management, ICT, and the like. ICT being information communication technology. Gentlemen, there, there is a, a wealth of information in this report, and I'm going to finish this conversation by asking you both a, a very easy question. Spit us to you, first of all. Um, Marsh Africa has lent its name to this document. Uh, what's the call to action here? What do, you, what do you want the risk community to do? Thank you, Jeremy. Um, I think Marsh Africa has, has lent its name. We've also provided um, a lot of IP into the project. I think when we started working with IRMSA in understanding the vision and trying to create this holistic framework, I think we really appreciated the, the scope of the project. So I think it was a real collaborative effort. And you know, maybe I'd like to just um, take a slight tangent and say that you know, we, we worked with IRMSA, you know, Marsh provided IP, we worked with our clients and members of Ermster, over 50 professionals that really put together this framework. Um, so it's a real collaborative effort. And I think the call to action for, for the members of Ermsa, for South African corporations at large is really to you know, understand that the world has changed, to understand that risk is at the forefront of how we need to think about managing our businesses. Risk is not an isolated event. You know, risk is both an opportunity and a challenge. Um, and thinking about the three disciplines, as we've highlighted many times in the guideline, I think adopting those and seeing how you integrate that into your business makes companies in South Africa and indeed the country much more future-proofed for, for challenges that we face. And we do face a lot of challenges um, as this country. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think the call to action is really, you know, Look at the guidelines, see how they are relevant to you, look to incorporate them in your business, because it ultimately is trying to create more resilient organizations that are better placed to deal with the challenges of the world. Chris, I'll give the final word to you. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, I would like to, to maybe say that the first most important call to action for me is a paradigm shift that needs to happen in the mind of, I suppose, um, the broader risk profession in as far as we are no longer just part of a sequential or a sequence of events. It is expected of us to become more. We should school ourselves in strategy and resilience. 
We don't have to become experts. We just have to be willing to collaborate with those experts in our organization. So I think that's the first call to action is to, to make the realization that we can be better by being more, by integrating with strategy and with resilience. The second one I would like to add is that this is not an uh, annual event. It is not an event that we do quarterly. This, I think, should be a mind shift in the C-suite that whenever we speak strategy, risk and resilience would be present. Whenever we speak risk, strategy and resilience will be present. And similarly with resilience, this is a collaborative discussion at all touch points within the, the guideline that, that we've shared. So that would be the second one um, that I would think is a call to action. And then of course, um, just responding to a question we had from one of the, this, the uh, our certified risk management pro professionals that said, Chris, does this mean we have to become strategists and we have to become business continuity management experts? My response to that is it won't hurt. The eyes of the world are on us. We have been put onto that platform uh, by COVID um, and we need to respond. And I do not believe is a bad idea that we align our training and our skills development plans to accommodate the integration of strategy, risk and resilience into each of those professions. Gentlemen, to both of you, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.